arguing. Fast you the maze, so you back jump. I'm a savage, yeah. Classy, bougie, ratchet, yeah. Sassy, moody, hey, nasty, hey, hey, yeah. Hacking, stupid, what was happening, oh, bitch? What was happening, oh, bitch? I'm a savage. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Murder Meals. Now, this video is going to be a little bit different just simply because I was supposed to film this weekend, but it's been a it's been a hard little weekend. So I'm gonna be doing this film today. Now for today's video, we're actually gonna be having breakfast for dinner. I'm gonna be making churro pancakes with a fruit salad. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Like always, if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe my video, like and share to help me grow as a channel. I am about nine subscribers away from my first goal of hitting 50 subscribers, y'all. So help your girl out because baby, without you, I cannot. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the unfortunate events that led to the murder of Jermica Whitehead, better known as Nikki Whitehead. On the afternoon of January 10th, 2010, a sheriff deputy was driving through Rockdale County. He was passing through a suburban neighborhood in Conyers, Georgia. All of a sudden, 16-year-old Tasmaya came flagging him down in the street, just panicking and crying. He immediately hopped out of the car when the 16-year-old told him that her and her twin sister had come home to their mother being murdered in their home. He immediately drove down to the home and what he found was just horrible he found jermica aka nikki whitehead dead in her bathroom jermica whitehead aka nikki was born april 18th 1995. now right off top she was born into an unfortunate situation she was actually born in prison due to her mother being incarcerated at the time for drug possession. So obviously her mother could not keep her in the penny with her. So her grandmother was the one who had to take custody of Nikki. So her grandmother, Della Frazier, raised Nikki. It was said that her mother didn't want anything to do with her or raising of a child so nikki always grew up with the feeling of not being wanted and just the feeling of neglect from her mother and just from people in general her grandmother really could not keep her on the straight and narrow it was really hard to what they like to say control her she would hang out with the wrong people and the wrong crowds. She got into drugs. It was said that she was into marijuana and the Coca-Cola. She would sneak out of the house and meet boys and she was having sex at a very young age. She did not want to follow the rules of her grandmother. She wanted to come and go. So at the age of 16, Nikki left home and moved out. Where she went is not quite sure. I guess she was going in between friends and boyfriends' homes. But unfortunately, due to the way that she lived her life and just, I don't want to say she was just for the streets or out there, but the way she lived her life, Nikki found herself pregnant at a young age. She got pregnant at the age of 17. Now being pregnant at such a young age wasn't a shock. She shortly found out afterwards that she was pregnant with twin girls. So on November 27, 1993, Nikki gave birth to two beautiful baby twin girls named Tasmia and Jasmia Whitehead, 
Taz and Jazz for short, because who's not about to struggle with their names is I. But now the girl's dad was never a part of their life. It was shortly discovered after Nikki became pregnant that their dad was already married. So he had wanted nothing to do with the girls or with Nikki. So the fact that they basically didn't have anywhere to live, Nikki and the two girls moved back in with her grandmother, Della Frazier. Now with her being basically a kid herself, she was only 18 whenever she had the girls. It was hard for Nikki to adjust to being a mom at such a young age. She wanted to still live her life, party, and do all the things that the young girls was doing. She wanted to be out here, which I definitely get. So the girls were mainly raised by their great-grandmother, Della. And Della loved the girls so very much. She adored being with them and spending time with them and just taking care of them. Nikki was around here and there, coming in and out, coming and going, but she was more seen as a big sister than a mother. The girls, of course, knew this was their mother, but it was more of a big sister, little sister type relationship. Don't get me wrong, Nikki loved her girls. As she got older, she wanted to get her life together. So she started getting on the path of doing right, I guess you could say. I don't know. But she went to cosmetology, cosmetology school and became a beautician. And she had even gotten into fashion school because she wanted to be a fashion designer. She kept her kids in a lot of activities. They were in ballet, piano, they were Girl Scouts. The girls were very smart and very sweet. They were eight honor roll students and they had the hopes of going to Harvard one day. That was their dreams that they were pursuing. Nikki kept the girls looking very nice, put together. She wanted to make sure that they represented the best and just, she did love them. In 2007, Nikki had requested full custody of the girls so she can start taking on more of a parent role in their life. Now, around this time as well, the love bug struck my girl Nikki. At 25 years old, Nikki met 55-year-old local long-distance truck driver Robert Head. They instantly hit it off. The first night that they met, he bought her outfit and they went dancing and they stayed out all night. Eventually, I was getting mixed reports about this part, so take it with a grain of salt. But eventually, um, Nikki moved out to move in with Robert Head. And at this time, the girls did not move with her full time. They still lived with their great grandmother and Nikki was living with her boyfriend. However, although they didn't start living, um, initially were living with their mother, Nikki did eventually move the girls in with her and her boyfriend. So all of them were living in Conyers, Georgia. Now to get back to the events of today's case, once the police were back after Taz had flagged them down, he instantly called for backup. Now, the police, he said that you could just instantly smell the strong stench of blood and copper. And he said this was one of the worst murder scenes that he has ever seen. And when I saw the pictures, it, it definitely was. I can't put them in my video because YouTube will be on my tail like white on rice. However, if you want to look them up, you can definitely do so. But look at your own viewer discretion may be advised. There was a big pool of blood stains all around the living room. There was broken, broken glass. There was blood splatters up the wall, on the back of the couch, on the table. It was even on the ceiling. There was a broken red shattered vase just laying on the ground. And there were blood drag marks to where you can see 
that clearly Nikki had been drugged at some point. There was even blood, like blood hand marks on the door where it looks like at some point Nikki was trying to escape, but clearly she was not able to. So Nikki's body was found in the bathtub. She was brutally murdered. She was stabbed over 80 times. Her, her spinal cord was almost completely severed and she was in the tub in a field with water and she was in nothing but her night clothes. Now, the killer did try to clean up the crime scene, but due to the amount of blood, it was just impossible to do so. They tried to wipe up the blood with towels and even tried mopping up the blood as well. There were blood marks inside of the laundry, the like laundry area room. And then when they looked, they noticed that there had been a stack of towels that were missing. So they start looking around like, where are the towels? They know that these same towels had just been used to try to clean up the blood, but where were they? They looked into the wash machine and lo and behold, there go the towels in there with other clothing articles. There was no sign of forced entry. So that was definitely suspicious to detectives. They also um, came to find out that their next door neighbor, it looked like there was blood on the front of their door and there had been bloody footprints leading to the door, but it looks like somehow Nikki was brought back in or she came back in, but they were just trying to figure out how did this get here? What happened? So due to the just extent and the overkill of Nikki's murder, police already knew that this had to be a crime of passion. It was someone that was close to Nikki that had to have done this. At this point, the girls were still at the scene of the crime. They were um, inside of the ambulance, you know, just making sure that they were okay and just, you know, waiting to be questioned by police. When um, the detective came to the ambulance, he noticed that Taz was biting her arm and he said, you know, hey, don't bite your arm. Don't do that. And she just simply replied, well, I always do this when I get nervous or when I'm stressed out and scared. The detective, he definitely thought that was weird, but he also just chalked it up to, well, these girls did just witness something terrible. You know, no kids should have to see their mother murdered and especially not in this type of way. So after speaking to the detective, the girls did inform um, the detective, let him know that their mom did have a boyfriend, Mr. Robert Head. Now, they didn't think that Robert had anything to do with this. Robert actually loved the girls a lot. He raised the girls like they were his own daughter. They spent a lot of time together, and they just didn't think that he had anything to do with the murder. Now, shockingly to police, they soon found out that although the girls didn't think that Robert had anything to do it do with this, they did have their suspicions on another person. The girls let the police officer that yes, their mother was with Robert Head, but she also had another man. They told detective that their mom had another boyfriend. His name was Joe, and the previous night they heard their mother and Joe arguing <laughs> let's just pray it's not salty y'all i think i'm good because i kind of dumped some out but whew, i knew not to do no mess like that now while the police were trying to get in contact with robert and track down nikki's other boyfriend joe the girls were taken down to the local police station for questioning. They were being questioned as a recorded victim's 
um, interview. So it wasn't just anything serious, but they just had to have it on recording just, you know, because everything was fresh and happening so fast. That's just, I guess, their procedures. Now, while they were waiting on detectives, you can see the girls on recording just crying and they were just so sad and distraught just saying how much they missed their mother and how they wanted their mother and how they can believe that she was gone and they were also crying out for their grandmother on the recording if you have jazz she was just saying how mom will never come back i want my mama and you can see taz um, responding in a way just trying to comfort her sister telling her jazz you got to be strong so they can catch the person who did this Taz even went as far as giving her sister a sweet little old kiss on the cheek, just comforting her. That's really sweet. Now, during this time, you can also just kind of hear the girls really sounded, I don't want to say babyish, but babyish in the video. Several times, Jazz asked for her mother. So they told the detectives basically what happened that morning in the home. They stated how they had woken up to get ready for school. And when they, whenever they went to tell their mother bye and that they were leaving for school, she was still alive. However, she wasn't answering her door. She kept her door dead bolted at night. So the girls, they left, but they said shortly after that, they realized that they had missed the bus. But instead of going home and disturbing their mom and asking her for a ride to school, they just decided to go ahead and walk to school. Now, the detective, he was kind of shocked. He was like, you walked all the way there? And they, were, they just simply was like, yeah, I mean, it's not that far. The detective was like, okay, I mean, some people just like to walk, I guess. Now, the detective did ask them, you know, did you all make it to school on time? The girl stated that they made it to school at their normal time. I think like within 10 minutes to spare or something, but they didn't miss any classes. And he was just basically saying, well, are these the clothes that you wore to school? And the girl said, yes, these are the clothes that we wore to school. And they stated they rode the bus home. And whenever they got home, that is when they found their mother's body. Now, one of the girls, I believe it was Taz, she um, did admit to touching the body at the time because she, I guess she was in shock just trying to see what was going on. What did catch um, detectives in shock, or by surprise, I should say, is the way that they spoke about their mother. Mind you, they just found their mother brutally murdered and the girls are speaking about their mother in a way that was just very negative. They was just saying how she was a party animal. She used to always stay out late, come home at late hours. And whenever she would come home, she would always just be bothering them. And just, they didn't really have anything positive to say about their mother. Now, whenever the police had questioned them further about their relationship with their mom, they did um, admit that, you know, the relationship with their mother was strained. They did struggle, you know, with it. However, they did still love their mother and they had nothing to do with her untimely demise. Now, something else that <clears throat> caught the detective uh, detective's eyes was that Although the girls were inside in the police station, they still had on their gloves and coats that they had on while they were outside in the cold. And police thought this was a bit odd. Your hands and your arms. What happened here? I got into a fight. When asked to remove their gloves and their coats, the police were shocked at what they saw. The twins had multiple bite marks on their arms. They had scratches. They even had cuts on their hands and fingers. Now, when asked about the bite marks on her arm, Jazz just simply said, 
that the bite marks had came from Taz and that they had gotten into a fight the previous day. And that's where she received these injuries from. And on top of that, one of the girls had a actual slice in their finger. I believe it was their ring finger. And the police were just looking at it, just dumbfounded, like what is happening? So the police did separate the girls for questioning. The girls were taken aback and they were offended that the police could ask them. They felt like they were being treated as if they were guilty. And the police were like, no, well, we're just trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. The girls, they stuck to their story. So although they were definitely suspicious and throwing multiple red flags, the police did have to go ahead and release the girls back to their great grandmother, Della, and they were free to go. The police were able to track down Nikki's boyfriend, Joe, ooh, pretty fast. And when they told him why they were there and that Nikki had been murdered, he was visibly shook. He started shaking and just convulsing and just broke down in tears. Police began to question Joe about his relationship with Nikki and wanted to know why they had gotten into an argument the previous night. Joe told police that Nikki was actually upset with him due to the fact that he told her that he was wanting to cut off the relationship because he was moving in with another woman. And Nikki did not want to have that. She didn't want the relationship to end and she just was super upset. So that's why they got into an argument. Police asked if they could look at Joe's arms and hands to see if they had, to see if he had any wounds or markings on him and he was clean as a whistle so joe was pretty quickly ruled out as a suspect now with joe ruled out as a suspect and robert being out of town so not having the opportunity to kill nikki police were just looking like well who else could we be looking at who else could possibly have wanted this poor woman dead? Then lo and behold, hi ho, the doggone Cherio, they say, let's take a look at the twins. When police started to ask friends of Nikki about the twins and if they had any reason to suspect that the twins would have wanted their mother dead, Everybody instantly said that them girls did it. That's when, that's when detectives got the real deal, holy spiel, about the girls and Nikki's tumultuous relationship and all the issues and struggles, struggles, all the issues and struggles that she has she has had with them. The problem has started whenever Nikki moved the girls into the home with her and her boyfriend Robert. Now, with Robert Head being a truck driver, he did long distance truck driving. Nikki was home with the girls a lot alone. So for the first time ever in their lives, Nikki was the girl's primary caregiver. She was the one that was enforcing the rules, the punishment and setting, setting it down, picking it up and doing all the things. And they did not like that. The girls did not like that. It went from Nikki being basically like a mother slash older big sister to being the one to tell them what they can and cannot do. The girls were used to kind of doing their own thing when it came to their great grandmother. Nikki found out that the girls were dating older men, 16, 17, and 18 year olds. And at this time, the girls were only 13. She felt as if they were heading down the same path that she had. And if it was one thing that she wasn't gonna let them do, she didn't want them to struggle or have the type of life that she had had. She thought that they were already being sexually active, 
um, with the boys as well. And she told them that they were not able to see nor talk to nor date any older guys. The girls took issue with this. They felt like their mother was being very hypocritical due to the fact of how she was growing up and how she was still now. They felt like she still went out partying, drinking, doing drugs, and had different men in and out, but yet she was steady telling them what they could and could not do when it came to the same things. Nonetheless, Nikki said that this is not how it's going to work and she said it was unacceptable for them to do these things. But the girls just being used to doing their own thing with their grandmother, they did what they did best and they just ignored their mother. But Nikki, she wasn't having that. She was um, determined to set rules for the girls and boundaries along with, along with consequences for breaking those rules and crossing those boundaries. So Nikki set punishments, and if the girls broke any of those rules, she would enforce those punishments. There were several 911 phone calls made to the police from Nikki. On one occasion, she had called 911 in a panic because she had found out that Jazz was missing. Apparently, Jazz had snuck in out of the house in the middle of the night to go see her boyfriend, and Nikki found out, and she called the police. On June 28, 2008, Nikki had taken the girl's phone as part of their punishment, and the girls didn't like that one bit. So their response was they were just going to tag their mama tail. The two girls viciously, viciously attacked their mother for taking their phone. Frantically, Nikki called 911. When the responding officer arrived, they the girls told the officer that they did not want to stay with their mom anymore they wanted to they wanted to stay with their grandmother where the rules were way more relaxed and less strict and they could just kind of do their thing the officer remembers thinking that the girls were really trying to sound super innocent and like they were just the sweetest of girls but she remembers just looking at Nikki and just remember the fear that Nikki had in her eyes when it came to the girls. And she just felt like Nikki knew that the girls, they were in it together. They would attack Nikki. They would jump Nikki together. And she was just fearful of her own daughters. And you can tell by her face. Now, after a while, the police officer was able to speak to the girls, and it seemed like things had calmed down. The girls just said that they were just going to go to their room, and they are going to go to bed, and they would just call their grandmother in the morning and just try to see if they can go visit her in the morning. So they just kind of left it there like things were fine, things are good. But the officer, she just said that she just had a feeling that things weren't over yet. And whenever she left, she wanted to make sure that she stayed close by. Now the officer, she stated that not even three or four minutes had gone by when she started hearing screaming and yelling just coming from the home. Another 911 call came in from the home and the officer, she just came straight back to the home where she saw Nikki running frantically out of the home with a cordless phone in her hand, just fear all in the poor woman's eyes. Nikki said that as soon as the officer left, the girls immediately started attacking her and jumping her. The girls, on the other hand, had another story. They said that once the officer left, Nikki started yelling and fussing at them, saying how they weren't going anywhere, they weren't calling their grandmother, and she started attacking them. However, when you looked at Nikki, you could see that she had scratches all over her chest, her face, she had red marks all over her body. She looked like she had been through something and she also looked visibly shook to the core. The girls, on the other hand, they was cool as a cucumber, baby. The police officer said that you could meet a stranger and the stranger would have had more empathy or sympathy, empathy, and emotion than these two girls did for their mother. So with the evidence pointing in the direction of the girls, 
the girls were taken into custody and charged. Now, with this, uh, with this, the girls were able to get what they want. The court did grant temporary custody back to the girl's great grandmother, Della Frazier. And the court ordered Nikki and the girls to go through family counseling just so they can work out some of their differences. At this point, the girls will be back and forth in and out of the courts for the next few years. Over the next few years, the girls' behavior just got more and more out of control. They started staying out more. They would go missing for days at a time to where they would go to friends' houses, boyfriends' houses, and just stay the night for three or four days at a time. And Della didn't know where they were at. And they had even started stealing from their own from their own grandmother and from other family and friends. Nikki's best friend and co um, co-worker at the beauty salon had actually said that the girls had stolen $200 from her. Della had to start sleeping with a deadbolt lock on her door in order to keep the girls out of there. On January 5th, 2010, Nikki had finally gotten what she had wanted for the past few years, and she had regained custody of her children. The kids had, the girls had became truant, and they were in and out of court, just in all types of trouble, and the courts just realized that they were just swapping out one situation to another. The girls begged and pleaded in court to the judge to not make them go back with their mother. They really just wanted to stay with their grandmother. They did not want to go back at all. They did decide to try out a two week custody hearing, well, a two week custody trial to where the girls would go live with their mother for the next two weeks. And then they would have a touch up just to kind of see how things were going and if everything was okay. But the girls, they were not trying to hear that. Jazz even said in the court hall, right there in front of her mother, that if I have to go live with you again, I'm going to kill you. And five days later, what happened to poor little old Nikki? From the time of Nikki regaining full custody and her murder, the police were called back to the home several times. I believe it was at least three times. One of the times being at the girls' welcome home party. With the police learning all of this information about the girls, things were not looking good for them. And on top of that, more and more evidence were pointing the police in the direction of Jazz and Taz. Back at the crime scene, like I stated, they found bloody towels inside of the wash machine, but they also found bloody clothes belonging to the girls inside of the wash machine. They found bleach stains on the carpet as if the killer had tried to clean all that up with some bleach. Clorox can do a lot of things, but it cannot perform miracles. Inside of Taz's room, they had found a pair of boots. On the boots, there was so much blood on it. But on the inside of the boots, they had found a clump of hair that looked like to have been pulled out of someone's head, wrapped inside some tissue paper and stuffed in the toe of the boot. They also found a journal that the girls shared between the two of them. They would write letters back and forth to one another. And in the journal, they talked about how much they hated their mother and how they wanted her dead. They needed to get rid of her. Now is the time for them to do it now. We're never gonna get rid of her. And when they performed the autopsy and looked over Nikki's body, they found hair inside of Nikki's teeth, hair matching the twins. Now, which one of the twins? We do not know because, as you know, they were identical twins. With identical twins, you do share DNA. And on the red vase that was recovered at the scene of the crime, 
they found not only Nikki's blood on it, which were to be expected, but they also found the girl's blood on the vase as well. The police were able to make a mold of Nikki's teeth and they were able to compare that mold to the bite marks on the girl's arm. And what do you know, the mold and the bite marks matched up perfectly. It was said that only someone who had a gap in their teeth could make those bite marks. And the only person who had a gap was Nikki. Added sugar and cinnamon to make a little mixture for the pancakes. Now, as you remember, I stated that Taz had been caught biting on her arm. What detectives believe she was trying to do, she was trying to mask her mother's teeth marks because their mom had latched on so hard that it left impressions on Taz's arm. And Taz was trying to cover that up. At this point, the evidence was so overwhelming. It was just looking like the girls were definitely the ones that did it. However, it was this last bit of evidence that just took it over the top. The girls had stated that they had walked to school and they made it to school on time. However, CCTV showed the girls walking to a local store and getting in a car with the unknown man. They then arrived at school mid-morning, like around 10 or 11 a.m. At that point, they had missed two or three classes. That contradicts what the girls said about them making it to school on time and then walking to school. So at this point, there were several hours of unaccounted time that the girls were just, where, doing what? Police were convinced that they knew where and what the girls were up to. So at this point, it had been about four months since the girls' murder. And on the last day of school, May 21st, the girls were arrested for the murder of their mother, Nikki Whitehead. The girls, they were separated. They were sent to two different institutions just simply because Police did not want the girls to be able to compare notes or compare stories or anything of the sorts. So on July 12th, the girls were indicted on murder charges. They, of course, pleaded not guilty and they sat in jail for the next four years. I guess the walls got the talking or something. But all of a sudden, the girls were singing a whole brand new song. And both of the girls' attorneys reached out to prosecutors and stated that the girls were willing to make a deal and confess and tell exactly what happened in order to face a lesser charge. So the girls both sat down and they told their version of what they said really happened that morning with their mother. The girl said that their mother had been out all night and she came home at the early hours drunk. She came into their room and was fussing and trying to fight with them. And they were at it for hours just going back and forth with their mother. She finally um, went to sleep, but the next morning when the girls had woken up late for school, Nikki had started yelling in their face saying that if they lived in her house, they were going to follow the rules. They were going to go to school. And apparently she reached and grabbed a pot and start swinging the pot around at them like she was trying to hit them with the pot. So she's swinging the pot around trying to hit Jazz with the pot. And then they all started fighting, arguing, yelling, just going back and forth, just doing the most. They said they had gotten the pot away from their mother. And at this point, that's when Nikki grabbed the knife and she started waving the knife around as well. At some point, they had ended up in the living room. And I'm not quite sure if a stab had already been exchanged, but 
Jazz came up behind her mother and broke the red vase over her mother's head, thinking that that was going to stun her mother, but it definitely did not. Nikki was definitely putting up a fight. At some point in the fight, Nikki had left out and that's when they say she went over to the neighbors. She was ringing and knocking on the door, trying to get help, but no one came, so she came back. They said that she sat at the counter or at the table, but all of a sudden she lunged towards the knife again, and she just started going at it. So Jazz at this point is fighting her mother, and they're kicking and scratching, and there's biting. Their mom, she said that her mom bit down so hard that she latched on and she just could not get her off of her. The she was just maybe hanging on for dear life. Jazz is punching her mother, just trying to get her off, elbowing her, doing the most. At this point, Taz stabs her mother. Then Jazz comes up behind her mother and starts choking her with the ribbon, one of those like first place gold medal ribbons those types of the ribbon she's choking her mother her mother is still trying to put up a fight she gives jazz the biggest backhand and just stuns the hell out of jazz i'm thinking jazz like pow 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 just stun jazz and then jazz i'm sure at this point is getting very upset energy is just going adrenaline is rushing anger is just the whole house is a mess Jazz picks up the knife and just starts stabbing her mother. Now, the girls are both just attacking her, stabbing her. And at this point, Nikki is still alive. So they both take their mom and they drag her and put her into the bathtub with water in the tub. The girls say that they remember saying they the girls say they remember how their mother was saying how she just hated them and they were going to end up in jail they said that they apologized to the mother for everything that they had done and they wish she hadn't gotten this far and they wish these things you know and this didn't happen they said that they watched their mother go down in the water a few times so eventually she went under and she never came back up at this point their mother Nikki Whitehead was dead and the girls said at this point it was so much confusion they say they cried they argued but eventually they came up with a plan to try to clean up they had to let that go and then they just went with the option of just going to school and going with that whole story they did admit that they thought that people would notice that their mother had been missing and they thought that by the time they got home, they could just pretend that they didn't know what was going on and they just walked home to a murder scene. But they were shocked when they got there that no police were there. In January 2014, Tasmia Whitehead pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter possession of a knife during a crime and making false statements. And in February, 2014, Jasmia Whitehead pled guilty to the same charges. Both girls were sentenced to 30 years in prison and they are currently serving their sentences out at two different locations. Jazz is currently serving her sentence out at Polky, Polsky State Prison and Taz is at Arendelle State Prison. Not much more has been heard from the girls or about the girls since their sentencing. They're currently still just serving out their time. We don't know when they're going to be up for parole or when or if they are going to be released. But for now, that's all I have for today's case. So tell me, how did you like my story today? Did you find it fascinating? Did you find it crazy? What do you feel about these girls do you think that they planned their mother's murder or was it just a bad situation that got out of control to where she ended up dead definitely tell me your thoughts down in the comments and again like subscribe and share my video i definitely appreciate you all for watching and until next time this has been murder mills bye